Well, the international economic think tank, the OECD, has warned that the UK will have the lowest growth among the big group of seven industrial countries next year. Only Russia, facing sanctions from the West over its war in Ukraine, will fare worse. Our economics reporter, Neil Macdonald, is here. Neil, why is the UK doing so badly compared to others? Well, the OECD says the whole world is facing the largest energy crisis in 50 years. Russia has, of course, disrupted gas supplies, and the price of that gas has surged. But how exposed you are to that determines how badly your economy is affected. So this is what the OECD thinks is going to happen to economic growth in some of the big economies next year. And you can see how um, if we bring on the United Kingdom. Yeah. There we are. We're doing worst of all. Worse, yeah. Of course, no one's doing very well. Yeah. Now, France, um, it produces most of its uh, electricity from nuclear power domestically. The United States, most of the gas it uses is produced domestically. That helps to insulate them from what's mm. happening to the international price of gas. Countries like Germany and the United Kingdom, they depend more on imported mm. gas, and so they are taking the brunt of this energy shock. So when's it going to get better? Well, the OECD is saying that we might actually be facing two difficult winters rather than just one. And what it's concerned about is gas storage in Europe. So I'll show you what the OECD thinks could happen. Um, we've got gas storage here. The line shows it falls from about 90%, falls down, obviously, as we use it during sure. the winter, and then goes back up from next spring as we fill up the storage capacity again. The line at the bottom, 30% storage. If you go below that, that's where you get the risk of disruption. But the OECD says, what happens if there's a much colder winter? There you see storage plummets right into the danger zone. And of course, there's a, there's a bigger hole that we then have to try and fill up. Mm. Um, and because of that, when you look at the following winter, the situation is very serious. And briefly, indeed. why can't they just fill up the storage facilities? Well, European countries have done a quite good job of that over the last summer. But a lot of that gas actually came from Russia. And of course, oh. Russia has now dramatically oh. cut back the amount yeah. it is supplying. And that doesn't, like, doesn't look like it's going to change at any time soon. Europe can go on to international markets and buy some gas. But then, of course, it's in competing with other mm. countries. So it's likely to not be able to get hold of as much gas as it wants and pay more for it. And critically, don't assume that none of this mm. affects us. The UK has direct physical links with the energy market in Europe. So if they are paying more for gas, then probably so are we. Neil yeah, McDonald, thanks very much. Jackie, let's go to Jackie in Leeds. Well, as we've just been hearing, it's likely that the problems plaguing the British economy will stick around for the next couple of years and therefore pass the next general election. Today, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, vowed he'd be a pragmatic PM in dealing with the economy. And in a speech to the Confederation of British Industry, he urged business leaders to wean themselves off cheap labour from overseas. Our business reporter, Amelia Jen, was there. They go on to PPE face masks, so they actually go over the, their, their bridge clips that go over the um, top of the nose. The pandemic boom in masks and the tiny strips in them have made this company hundreds of thousands. From razor blades to kettle connectors, the chances are Brandauer's small metal products are somewhere in your home. They've got big plans for expansion, but just can't fill the roles. The, the entry-level jobs right up to senior management, there is a shortage of good people to do all of those jobs. We're having to work twice as hard to find the same number of people as we perhaps were looking for five or six years ago. But like the Prime Minister, Sakir Starmer played down increased immigration to plug the more than million-strong worker shortage forgetting perhaps that he himself called for freedom of movement in his own leadership campaign. He told business leaders at the Confederation of British Industry he'd take a pragmatic approach to shortages in the short term, but that his focus would be better pay and more skills for British workers. But our common goal must be to help the British economy off its immigration dependency, to start investing more in training workers who are already here, but let me tell you, the days when low pay and cheap labour are part of the British way on growth must end. I think they're a little bit deluded in terms of solving the growth problem. I can understand we can upskill our existing workforce, but that takes time. 
And unfortunately, the opportunity is now, and we have to seize it, which means we do need more immigration as part of the initial solution. The levers of growth are few and far between in a recession. The best and cheapest one, says the Confederation of British Industry, is increasing time-limited visas for workers right now. This is a here and now crisis. We are saying, you know, get migration going. And we are short here of not just data and tech things, but we're missing butchers, baggage handlers, hospitality, healthcare. There's jobs at all levels that are not being thought, and that's holding back growth. This is a different Labour Party, and there's no going back. We're ready for partnership. This isn't just business, but the business of politics. And Sir Keir was on a mission to claim his was a party that respected profit and private enterprise. I felt as if, as if he was believable um, in terms of his desire to work in collaboration with businesses, and that's really good to hear. Sir Keir Starmer, yes or no? I think he's, he's heading in the right direction. I think he made the right, the right noises, um, certainly the right comments around the business side partnership side of things. The test now is whether his common sense, which I found very impressive, is also supported by the rest of his party. And if it is, then I think that's a convincing package. The next election is one that will almost certainly be fought along economic lines, lines being refashioned here in Birmingham. But that short-term fix business is calling for, rejected for now, by party leaders who see more immigration as too high a political price for growth. Earlier I spoke to the business minister, Kevin Hollenrake, about immigration and the economy, but I began by asking him for his reaction to the prospect of rail strikes around Christmas time, as we covered earlier. I would say to the, the unions generally that these have devastating effects on people's lives and their, their livelihoods. So I would think twice. I would say to both, both sides, in any, any industrial dispute, get around the negotiating table, come to a sensible place, and uh, usually there is a middle ground we can find. Do you have any sympathy for the rail workers? They just, they need more money, like everyone else in this country at the moment. I have sympathy with everybody who's struggling right now, with energy costs, with cost of living, all those things. But we're all suffering that, both in the private sector, the public sector, every different sector. And I think most people are realistic enough to know you can't settle very, very high wage demands. The postal workers are striking, the railway workers are striking, the nurses are striking, the teachers are striking, the university um, lecturers will be striking. I mean, there's, there are so many people on strike. We've got double-digit inflation. You could be forgiven for thinking that we're back in the 1970s. Well, I think there are dangers in second round effects of inflation around wage settlement, that's true. But I say most of the pressures in terms of inflation levels right now are energy costs and supply chain pressures still. Uh, about two thirds of the pressures. So despite some higher than normal wage settlements, and most settlements are between five and 6% right now, um, you know, despite those things, most of the pressure inflation should start to moderate by the middle of next year. But so it, I don't think we're in the same situation that you're, you're setting out. The OBR that has now been, you know, having been sort of buried in a shallow grave by the Trust government has now been resurrected to a body that we respect, that you respect. They have said, looking at those numbers, that we are worse off than our European neighbours because, in part, because of Brexit. I can read you the quote. It's a quite, a, quite a trenchant quote. They said, significant adverse impact on trade. You're, well, you know, uh, you're responsible for trade. What's your response sure. to that? I mean, the vote to leave the European Union was a vote for change. There's no doubt about it. That will cause short-term pressures. But not They're change for the labour supply. No one voted for worse change, did they? They were voted for better change. Well, I, I can't speak for everybody who voted for whatever mm. they voted for, but there were, there's definitely a period of adjustment. You know, your comment on what the OBR said about the significant adverse impact on trade because of Brexit. Do you agree with them? Well, there are no question, as I say, that there are some, there are some pressures in terms of trade, cross-border trade, in terms of access to labour. There are pressures. These are all solvable problems, but they will, they will cause some challenges in the short to medium term. But we are, we are, if you look at net migration today, for example, and the OBR speaks about migration too, net migration is about the same level as it was prior to Brexit. Mm. We're just having a different, we're higher skilled workers rather than lower skilled workers, which most people would welcome, because that's more appropriate for the UK economy if we want to build that high wage, high skilled economy. What I'm hearing from business, and I think what you're hearing as well, 
is that they want more people, they want more labour, they want more migration, and you're about to give them that, aren't you? Well, we have a points-based system that allows us to uh, moderate or change uh, migration flows according to needs. So we've got to make sure we tailor the, the scheme, the system, we incentivise business investment. That's how we can become a more productive economy, ju ju not just rely on overseas labour. Which is exactly, again, what Keir Starmer said today. Yeah. He wants more skilled immigration to this country to tailor it. the needs of business. So, so <laughs> actually, on, on the question of migration, you and the Labour Party you know, are singing from the same song sheet. Well, I say talk is cheap. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you honestly believe Labour will deliver on that? I mean... The, well, the, the, excuse me, I mean, you know, there are well, many things that this government, that your government has promised over recent years that have then, you know, that has been, that has ended up in the dust heap of history. No Labour government has ever left office with unemployment lower than when it started, when it, when it uh, entered office. I mean, that's a pretty shocking statistic. Finally and briefly, when you look at the strike landscape, when you look at double-digit inflation, when you look at growth, when you compare our position to the rest of Europe, one could say to the British public, couldn't one, you've never had it so bad. Well, listen, things are tough. and I, I, don't, uh, I don't shy away from that at all for households and businesses, but I don't buy into the picture you paint that somehow the world's going to hell in a handcart or this country is. We need to do better. Of course we do. We need to get businesses to invest. We need a high wage economy, economy, more productive economy. We need to invest in infrastructure, but that's everything what the, the, the Prime Minister set out to do. Mm -hmm. Kevin Hollerick, thank you very much. My pleasure. Now, Business Minister Kevin Hollerick talking to me earlier there, as you just heard, and making that point that the UK needs more skilled immigration. But as we heard earlier as well, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer used a speech of the CBI today to argue that Britain needs to wean itself off immigration dependency. Well, I'm now joined by the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper. Yvette Cooper, welcome to the programme again. Evening, Matt. Um, isn't there a sort of rather brutal truth here, if I can sum it up like this, that politicians like you, or indeed like Kevin Hollingray, can't cope with the economic consequences of too little migration, but you can't cope with the political consequences of too much, and you're caught in the middle. Well, if you want to have a proper long-term plan for the economy, you have to look at what the causes are of some of the skills shortages we face. So we support a points-based system. We won't return to free movement, but the point of a points-based system is to focus visas on those areas where there are skills shortages. But at the problem at the moment is that then doesn't link to the training system. It doesn't link to pay and conditions. And what we're saying is we think the points-based system should be reformed so so that it is properly right. linked with long-term training plans, long-term plans around employment standards, because that is the way that you address the kinds of shortages that we face for the long term right. and not just look at the short-term issues. But you're not, going, you're not saying that you're going to reduce immigration, are you? Because you need those jobs. The economy needs those jobs. So we're not setting a net migration target. David Cameron did that and it failed. But we are saying that there are areas where we need more training. And for example, there are areas around IT, which is one of the highest areas where we have overseas recruitment and where we're going to continue to mm. need international talent and skills. However, the levels of training in AI in the UK are significantly lower than right. other countries. We have to turn that round. And that's why we want these long-term commitments around training and around investment in skills. If you do that, then in those areas, then actually you need less overseas recruitment and you have more of the investment in uh, people living in the UK mm. being able to get those jobs in future. But what you're saying is remarkably similar to what the Tory government is saying now. And, and here's the truth, is it not? That David Cameron, yes, wanted to reduce uh, uh, immigration to the tens of thousands. He has failed at that as of subsequent Tory governments, but Gordon Brown in a distant era, 16 years ago, said British uh, workers for British jobs, which has also failed. And the thing is, neither of you, neither Tories nor Labour, can get round this problem. You need the workers now, and whenever you say there's going to be a long-term fix, you're always going to go for short-term solutions. 
Well, the problem at the moment is there's no links. So let me give you an example of the kinds of things that we think need to be reformed. At the moment, if a job goes onto the shortage occupation list, it can stay there indefinitely, and yet there be no proper plan to improve training or skills in that area, or perhaps to tackle some of the problems around pay and conditions that are holding recruitment back. We've said, we've highlighted examples, for example, at our NHS, where we will continue to support the health and social care visa, which provides for recruitment from abroad where people have come and you know done hugely important work for generations in our NHS. Of course that continues. However, what Labour would do is double the number of medical right. training places, a substantial increase in the training for medical professionals here in the UK. So we would actually tackle some of those training and skills shortages. Okay. The government isn't doing that. All right. That's why we need to link the two things together. Two more briefly, if I may. Um, the OBR has said very clearly that Brexit has had a significant and negative impact on trade. Do you agree with the OBR? Would you blame Brexit for that? Well, I think the government has messed up a whole series of things. And what Keir Starmer and Rachel Reese have said is we've got to make Brexit work. We think that that includes some of the areas around, for example, veterinary agreements, where uh, sensible discussions and measures could be put in place that would deal with some of the pressures and the problems that uh, that, right. that businesses are facing. So we do think there are those but, kinds of things that could be done. Party... But we're not proposing right. returning to the single market or, okay. or to institutional structures in the EU. And why not? Because we've had those discussions, we've got uh, an agreement in place. The point now has to be to make Brexit work and to be able to get on with things and not to go round the houses again on those constitutional discussions and to focus particularly on the areas where we can make a difference to get economic right. growth. On trade, that does mean around veterinary agreements, but, but there's also a lot of other areas around the Green Prosperity Plan that Rachel and Keir have set out. But the current agreements make us poorer, don't they? That is just the, the simple reality of the post-Brexit Britain, we are poorer than we were before. And, yet, you know, what makes you think you're going to find a secret source of making us less poor? Well, we think, for example, to repeat again, that veterinary agreement would be important both in terms of addressing some of the issues That's around the border. That's a veterinary agreement. No, it's quite important, though, because it's part of the issues around the Northern Ireland mm. uh, protocol and also some of the wider trade arrangements. We think there are other areas yeah. where we can look around professional qualification agreements and look at some of those mm. issues on a really practical basis. But we've also got to boost the long-term growth okay. of the economy. And a lot of that also requires the shift to green energy that will yeah. help cut energy bills help also drive our economy with the best green manufacturing okay. and the kinds of skilled jobs we need for the future too. Finally and briefly, Yvette Cooper, uh, Mick Lynch of the RMT has said that the Labour Party is siding with the Daily Mail you know, and the plutocrats by not supporting the strike action. When are you going to be seen on the picket line uh, supporting the strikers for the RMT? We've been very clear about this. The government has to take action to get round the table and get a deal. This is it's a really difficult for the workforce who, you know, are obviously trying to do their best to get a fair pay agreement, but also for passengers who are being affected and for the economy as well. We need a deal in place and the government ought to be being responsible about this. It's been total chaos, not just around... But you are called the Labour recently, Party. ...but also what's happened around the, you know, the, the millions being paid to failing companies, the huge numbers of train cancellations and so on. Yeah. So what the approach we've taken in government in the past was to work mm. with employers, with trade unions and to get deals in place. That is the approach that we would take. That is the approach that Lou Haig our shadow transport secretary would be taking if she was in government and would actually be working with everybody to get this sorted out. Right.